And we have Ben coming up. Ben, are you with us? Ben is with us. Ben is with us. How are you, Ben? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm stoked to hear about what you're up to. Uh, we're going to be discussing ML flow in the context of Gen AI. Is that true? Yeah. Some exciting okay. features the team's been working on. Okay. So uh, let's see them. Do you have your slides ready? I do. Here they are. Awesome. Okay, Ben. So good luck. I'll be back. Sounds good. Hey, everybody. I'm Ben. I'm one of the ML flow maintainers. I work at Databricks in uh, the software engineering department for ML. Uh, I've been at Databricks about six and a half years now, uh, but work on the, the team now that supports a lot of open source packages uh, related to ML. And today I'm going to be talking about stuff that a lot of people have been talking about recently, which is agentic workflows and how you can actually use stuff uh, in your own data sets and your large volumes of data to build intelligent agents using Gen AI and particularly focusing on the production aspects of this about how to go from the demo state into something that you can deploy and actually get real use out of your data uh, without having to expend a lot of time and energy uh, of doing uh, analysis of it. All right, so a quick inter introduction about why we're talking about this and why agents are so powerful for leveraging your data. Uh, the rate of data that is being collected around the world uh, is is increasing at an alarming rate. Uh, and with these increased amount of data that companies are pulling in, being able to make use out of that in a very timely manner is complex. Uh, over the years, people have, have touted that, oh, we can build analytics use cases that make it simpler to analyze your data and, and gather insights out of it. But that restricts the access of that data to highly specialized people that know how to write code and write, write queries and you know build visualizations that explain a story out of that but it doesn't help the end users who want to get an in you know, an answer based on company data really quickly and being able to parse through that data and get those answers is something that is very complex to do uh, and requires a lot of specialized training so with agentic frameworks we can leverage gen ai capabilities with large language models and agentic tools you know, functions that are created that can execute against your data or they can query your data, uh, as well as uh, some rather clever things that have been uh, put out in open source packages recently where we can have multiple agents having turns with each other, each taking a different role in order to provide the most accurate answer based on the data that is available to them that is contextually accurate to the question being asked. Now, getting started is a little bit complex because there's so many different providers out there that can provide LLM access. There's tools out there that allow you to build these agents. Uh, the field is very crowded. Uh, and if I were to list out all the companies that I've either tested out their product or worked on integrations with, uh, or have just heard about, I would have an entire slide deck of probably 50 slides with just logos. Uh, so it's, it's a very crowded space. A lot of people have been around for a while, have varying levels of of sophistication and what their offerings can do. And because of all this complexity, it's really hard to know how to get started on building these things, about how to leverage your data with these new technologies and make it so that you can you know, solve an actual business use case that you need. Now, at its core, an agent that we're talking about, slightly different from you know the LLMs that most people are familiar with, is, is basically software code that it's, a, a system that is designed in order to answer questions by generating content based on context that it acquires. And these agents can implement very complex, you know, back and forth decision making processes and being able to access system data uh, through stuff like retrieval uh, to fetch your data. Uh, and it can employ technology like techniques such as few shot learning in order to optimize the responses that it's then generating to do further processing what this means in a nutshell is instead of just interfacing with a generally trained model like you would with say openai's chat gpt you can get contextually aware responses to what you're asking about because it's able to leverage the data that you have and that you've put in an indexable system so that that can be supplied to a general language model 
And the TLDR of this is you can use your data, use some very fancy model that somebody else has trained, and you can get these answers quickly. And you can actually ask very complex questions to these because of this multi-turn you know, architecture that is employed. It can evaluate and adapt to you know, staged responses that are happening based on actual data. Now, getting started with building one of these things, uh, there's a lot of examples out there. Uh, countless numbers of blog posts, uh, even the MLflow group. Uh, we've written a bunch of them. You can check them out on mlflow.org. But there's a, a massive leap between building something that is a really fun demo that might take an afternoon to build and then moving over towards a production grade agent, agentic system that can be deployed and you could actually expose these endpoints to your entire business or to customers in order to get better responses to questions they might be asking or insights they want to get about the company or about what it is that you're doing. And some of those things that make this very, complica like very complex is that when you build one of these agents, just interfacing with those APIs, it's effectively a black box. You may be defining what you're actually doing in that agent, but you can't really see what's going on for an individual request that comes in. So they're incredibly hard to debug. Uh, it's basically this non-deterministic system that you have no idea why it's making the decisions that it's doing or why it's it's answering the way that it is. There's also the complexity with retrieval relevance. There's a whole bunch of things that need to be thought of when you're doing something like taking your data and indexing it and putting it into a vector retrieval system, making sure that you're setting up and chunking your documents in a way that information retrieval is is as relevant as possible. You don't have too big of a context that's coming in because it costs a lot of money and is, you know, it takes a while to, to search through and also not too small uh, so that you're actually losing context on a broader question of something that's a little bit more complicated as well as how many documents to retrieve and what to do with them. The prompt engineering that goes into what is actually being sent to the general language models, that's complicated and takes a lot of time to figure out how to optimize that. And then the index retrieval stage itself, like how does that actual system return the documents? Uh, it's really hard to evaluate this and test it out and you know go through a, a process of seeing which configurations work best for particularly you know scenarios that you're trying to build. The process of building these things as well is much faster than in traditional ML. Uh, it, you can get responses really quickly. You can change just a few things and it's pretty easy over a short period of time to get lost in the weeds of, okay, I've tested out a thousand things and something that was 40 or 50 iterations ago was what I actually worked better than what I'm the rabbit hole that I'm going down right now. How do you get back to that or see what the state is of that while you were developing it 40 or 50 iterations ago, a couple of hours before. So keeping track of everything is something that's pretty challenging. And then which library to integrate with and you know, there's lots of them out there that build that allow you to build agents. All of them take slightly different approaches to what it is that they're trying to solve and what works best for particular different scenarios and use cases. So it's it's really hard to know where to where to go and what the capabilities are of all these different things without spending weeks or months of evaluating all of them for a production use case. So what our team has been doing and focusing on over the last year or so is we're trying to build in a bunch of tooling into MLflow in order to make it support the Gen AI work stream as best as possible. And these include a bunch of tools that we've built that allow you to leverage what MLflow is good for uh, historically, which is tracking your experiments and making sure that you know what it is that you've done in the past so that you can go back and either resume from that point or deploy what it is that you've actually recorded uh, to a, you know, a serving endpoint. But on the Gen AI space, we've we've looked at what these problems are. We've gone through and dog fooded this. We've built a bunch of stuff where we've we've tried to, you know, walk in a user's shoes and see what actually is the what are the pain points here and, and why is this so difficult to build these things for a, a real world use case. So we built MLflow tracing, uh, and that allows you to see inside that black box. It's no longer a black box. You can see exactly what it's doing, what each input is going to each stage of an agent and understand and be able to 
you know, leverage your analysis of that to make modifications to your agent in order to hopefully make it better. Uh, being able to evaluate your the retrieval relevance, like the documents, those chunks that have been encoded, seeing which ones are returned and what the contents are of those. Uh, that's something that is baked into MLflow Evaluate, uh, as well as visible within MLflow Tracing. You can see exactly what is being fetched and are those documents actually relevant? Do you need to do something with your data in order to make it more relevant or how you're indexing it? Uh, prompt engineering and the vector index configurations for retrieval, evaluate helps out with that too. So every iteration that you're doing, every test that you're doing, you have a hypothesis of how to make something better. You can evaluate it and test it on a, on a uh, you know, static data set that you have, you know, a question and a gold standard answer and how close does it get to that? And we can score that. And then the whole process of this fast iterative development, when you're trying these things out and trying to make improvements or trying to build new functionality and being able to, to basically snapshot and log the state of that in a, in a system that hopefully you're, you're pretty familiar with in MLflow tracking, you can get the exact state of what that is logged to the tracking server. You can see it in the UI. You can look at all the metadata associated with it, what configurations you did, and also see what the evaluation results are. Uh, and then also look at the traces and you can see really what's going on and, and which is the best candidate for, for deployment. And then baked into support of this is a number of, you know, Gen AI libraries that we're making official integrations with. So it simplifies the process of actually logging these things and using them and deploying them. And here on screen is a, a quick demo of, of tracing. Uh, in MLflow. This is a pretty cookie cutter one where it's just a very simple, you know, arithmetic that's being done. But this shows the, the general UI approach of, you know, here's my entry point into my application, some functions that I'm calling, and I'm getting a report on what actually was for each of these steps when I call, you know, an addition step and then a subtraction step, I'm seeing what the inputs and outputs are for each of those individual stages. And then in general, the input and output that is at the top level, you know, the parent span, that's showing you what the user is actually doing. So the user's input and then the system's output. But being able to really dig into that, here's another example of tracing for uh, Autogen, which is an, an agentic framework that allows for multi-turn passing of, of agents defined with specific roles. You can integrate tool calling and stuff into it as well. But we can see it this particular trace, this is mapping out everything that that agent has been doing. So the, the initiate chat step is showing us what that, that input that came into uh, the call to the agent, and then the final output of what the, the agent actually responds to with the user. But we can see these different assistants that have been de defined within here and individual steps that are happening within that assistant. So the assistant is is making a call to a language model and it's getting a response from that we're logging all of those those things including the metadata parameters which are logged as attributes things that we really want to know when we're evaluating the results of an agent well what model did it use and what were the configs that were passed with that do we need to change some of those in order to improve the responses so you can iterate and do another test with slight modifications where you have this this state you know this the source of truth the statement of what has been tested over time uh, some of the libraries that we are offering automatic, you know, we, we offer it through MLflow's auto log feature, but automatic tracing where you don't have to configure anything. You don't have to set any, any particular calls within your code. You just call auto log and we'll trace for you. Uh, we'll apply all, all of the, the instrumentation that's needed in order to wrap all of these calls for these agentic frameworks. So Autogen, Llama Index released recently, Langgraph, which is part of Langchain. And we're currently working on DSPy support. Uh, so all of these official flavors will be at the, the top level namespace of MLflow uh, to make it very simple to use these. And just as an example of something, uh, this is the type of thing that you can do with, with these agent frameworks. So I'm loading a model from MLflow that I, I logged. Uh, and this is a fairly complex agent that was built. And once I load that up, I can just call predict on it uh, and 
that's what a, a user's information would be. Uh, in the back end for this, there's a whole bunch of things going on. Uh, the vector index that's being used for the agent to be able to retrieve information is the entire corpus of Wikipedia. Uh, so it's got all of this additional data that's not just a generally trained model to answer this question. Uh, and it's doing a bunch of steps within here to say, well, I need information about Blu-ray discs and how much data can they store and what is the dimensions of a Blu-ray disc. There's a standard associated with that. So it's going and pulling all of that data and then calling, you know, a tool function call to actually calculate uh, a bunch of basic math, basically to determine, you know, how can I calculate how many Blu-ray discs would be uh, based on this? So this abstract question that's fairly ridiculous uh, has a bunch of steps that it needs to do in order to answer this. And there's another, you know, endpoint API that is called after this agent is done in order to generate an image. And agents are capable of building things like this. And with an integration with MLflow, we make it very simple to, to build these things and make it so that you can do things like even log images like this directly to it to, to determine what the state of your agent is over time. And that's about it for my talk. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Ben, perfect timing. Uh, I have a bunch <laughs> of questions for you. But I am only going to ask you the ones that a couple of people put in the chat before folks shuffle out to the roundtable. OK, so Ignacio here is asking, do we have similar capabilities in MLflow for diffusion models, or is this only for LLMs? Uh, we're actually doing design on that right now. Uh, <laughs> we want to make it so that we can support uh, like a little bit more native you know, image model, image generation model. There's a blog that I just reviewed this morning, actually, that is about using Autogen for automatic generation of improved prompting for Dolly 3 integration. And it shows how to actually log the images that are generated and a prompt to image index mapping. Uh, so check that out uh, on our blog post. You'll see exactly how to do this today in MLflow. But we are working on making it a little bit simpler. Ignacio, stay tuned. Kate uh, is asking, I'm working on RAG evaluation right now, and I looked into TrueLens, Giscard, RAGAS. MLflow is in my backlog to try. Can you please shortly compare these tools and say how MLflow stands out? Uh, funny, Giscard actually is a plugin for MLflow, so you can you can use both at the same time. Uh, we have like a partnership with them. Uh, for our evaluate, uh, you can use uh, a lot, like most of the stuff that we're using are using LLMs as the evaluation tool, which is fairly popular. Um, but we're actually working over the next quarter to improve MLflow's evaluate capabilities. One of the things that we're going to be doing soon is making it so that the prompts that are being generated as an evaluation function definition is something that's callable because we want to be able to be able to be used in a broader ecosystem. So if other tools have evaluation functions that are defined, you should be able to use that in MLflow. Right now, it doesn't kind of work like that. Um, but we want to, our process is making it more open so that we're not we're not taking a stand and drawing a line in the sand of like, you have to use MLflow to do exactly this to everything's baked in. We want to make it more open. Um, so that's hopefully that that gives you some guidance. One more comparison question. Uh, Eric is asking, how does MLflow tracing compare to Langsmith's traces? Uh, they're fairly similar in functionality, and it's not really a differentiator. We think of it as table stakes. And mm -hmm. I think most other Gen AI frameworks out there, everybody's building it because it's it's such an immediate need uh, in order to build these things for a production use case. So I think most frameworks, the functionality is going to converge, and your features are going to be pretty ubiquitous across all the different platforms. The thing that stands out for us is we have tracking. So we have the entire ecosystem as well as tracing. But uh, that's what we're going for is making a single unified experience to make it simpler to do these things. Ben, thank you very much for your time. Uh, if folks have more questions, perhaps you can stick around for a little bit longer in the chat. And uh, good to have you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks.